It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Deputy Premier. For the last two weeks, the Premier has ignored the growing concern about the clear conflict of interest he showed in personally appointing a family friend as OPP Commissioner. Now even Ron Tavener himself has admitted that he can't assume command under the cloud of suspicion created by the Premier. Government side, come to order. Will the Deputy Premier continue to defend the indefensible? Or will she admit that we need an investigation by the Ombudsman and by members of this Assembly before this appointment can proceed? The Deputy Premier. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. All right. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. You know, our government, the Independent Hiring Committee, our public service, has 100 per cent support and trust and faith in Superintendent Tavner. Out of respect for the people who serve our uh, province on the front line, our police officers, Ron Tavner asked me if he could step aside and while the investigation was taking place. I accepted that recommendation. I think it was a very wise and, frankly, respectful thing for him to do because he understands the process and he wants the process to Opposition have Opposition side, come to order. We are doing that. We understand that the independent officer of the Legislative Member Assembly, for Essex, come the, to order. the Integrity Commissioner, will do his investigation Spons. and his work. At that point, when the investigation is complete, I will be right at the front of the line to congratulate Ron Tavner and welcome him as the Commissioner of the Thank you. Supplementary. Once again to the Acting Premier, the Deputy Commissioner of the OPP is just one of the many people who has raised serious concerns. In a letter to the Ombudsman, Deputy Commissioner Brad Blair said, side, come to order. and I quote, the independence and confidence of the command of the OPP was at risk without a review from the Ombudsman. Does the Deputy Premier agree with the Deputy and now former Acting Commissioner that we need this independent Public review. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, to be clear, the independent review is happening currently yeah. through the Integrity Commissioner. Okay. But what I am hearing since Friday is people from across Ontario talking about what are we going to do to ensure that we keep the heat on and the power on in the All province right. of Ontario. That is ultimately why we are here this week. That is what should, we should be debating. And that is what my focus is and our government's focus is. Final supplementary. I think they've been watching the PC News. Once again to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Commissioner Blair doesn't stand alone. Former RCMP Commissioner Bob Paulson has echoed calls for an independent public review, saying, quotation, that sense of integrity of the institution has to be preserved, end quote. The former OPP Commissioner Chris Lewis was more blunt, quote, it's simply not right and not the best for the organization, end of quote. The Premier responded by calling the integrity of this decorated OPP veteran into question. The Deputy Premier must know, she must know this isn't right. Will she stand with these decorated officers and back their calls for independent review, or will she stand with the Premier who attacks them? Members, please take your seats. Minister. You know, Speaker, in the 10 plus years that I've served in this parliament, I have never, ever heard someone suggest that the independent officer of the Legislative Assembly, the Integrity Commissioner, had anything but respect for this chamber. They report to this chamber, not to individual members. So to suggest that they are not in any way independent and they can't do the investigation, I think is shameful. I want to see the NDP say, we respect the independent officer, we respect the integrity commissioner, and we will allow him the time that he and his office need to do the investigation and issue the report. Thank you. Next question. The member for Brampton Centre. 
Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Under the Members' Integrity Act, the Integrity Commissioner has the right to launch a public inquiry into any matter that has been referred to him. This matter is before him now. Will the Acting Premier join us in supporting a public inquiry into the event the Commissioner calls for one? The Deputy Premier. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, I'm not sure what part of the Independent Integrity Commissioner investigation has already started. He has accepted. Don't they understand? Opposition come but to order. To be clear, the investigation has begun. The Integrity Commissioner is in charge of that investigation. I look forward to the report because I know he will find that there was nothing wrong with the process, and Ron Tavner is an excellent choice for OPP Commissioner. I, I am surprised, frankly, that you are not asking questions about what's going to happen at the Brampton Civic Hospital when we don't have any heat on. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, I would love to ask questions about Brampton Civic, but I know I'm not going to get any answers anyway, so I'm not going to waste my time on that. Would the Deputy Premier agree that given the serious Her? nature of the questions of the appointment, questions that the Premier frankly won't even answer, is a public inquiry necessary? And it's public. It's not just the Integrity Commissioner. It's a public inquiry that we're asking for. Minister. I, I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots, Speaker, yeah. respectfully. So, an independent officer of the Assembly is independent and okay until they don't give you what you want. They are independent. Let them do their work. Let them do the investigation. Let the report come forward, and then we can talk about how excellent a candidate Ron Travner is for the OPP. You can't have it both ways. Either... Um, back to the Deputy Premier. Uh, people want and deserve answers. The Premier claims that a close personal friend was granted this position, and he has no, he's had no role in the decision-making process. Government side, come to order. That friend was not even qualified to apply for the job that was originally posted. We need Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, come to order. going to be upheld, and people are going to feel confident in the process. Will you support a full public inquiry by the Integrity Commissioner? The question is very simple. Minister. Let's try. Members, please take their seats. Minister. So, allow me to my re repeat myself. Again, the independent officer of the Legislative Assembly, the Integrity Commissioner, is currently investigating the process for hiring Commissioner Ta Ron Tabman. I, I do not understand why the OPP and uh, why the opposition have suddenly decided that the independent officer Remember of the Assembly, Simmons, the Integrity door. Commissioner, is not up to the job. I think it's really unfortunate yep. that you suddenly decide an independent officer of the Assembly, the Legislative Assembly, reporting to the entire chamber is not good enough for this process. It's shameful. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the Deputy Commissioner of the OPP has raised serious concerns about a request from Dean French, the Premier's Chief of Staff, to sole source a custom-designed camper van exclusively for the Premier's use and keep the cost off the books and hidden from taxpayers. Speaker, my side, question to, to the Deputy Premier is, has Dean Remember French bon, shared the specs for this Premier's Hot Wheels Magic Mystery Tour bus with Cabinet? <laughs> members, please take their seats. The Deputy Premier. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional you know, Services. Uh, that, that, that question is so rude and dismissive. I, I'm actually amazed that you were willing to ask it. Why, why, when we are called 
opposition side we don't order. Before Christmas, why are we not asking questions about why we're here, the importance of why we're here, the value of what we are trying to do to the people of Ontario? This is about heating people's homes. This is about keeping seniors safe. This is, frankly, about making sure that the province of Ontario can continue to operate after Friday. When is the NDP going to step up and be part of the solution instead of constantly trying to find some other nuance? This is about the people of Ontario having heat and hydro. House, come to order. I appreciate the enthusiasm of the members. It's all part of the season. But I have to be able to hear the member who has the floor. Start the clock. Member for Essex, supplementary. Speaker, we wish the Premier and his government would learn a little something about collective bargaining with the power workers, free and fair collective bargaining. It's got a, to order. a mystery tour bus for him and his buddies at taxpayers' expense. <laughs> Speaker, the Fuck. okay. The government side has to come to order. I will ask you individually to come to order, and then I will have to move to warnings. If need be, we move to the next step. Apologize to the member for Essex. Start the clock. Thank you, Speaker. The Deputy Premier was the choice of most PC delegates in the leadership race, so it has to be pretty tough for her to watch what's become of her party. The party that was once the party of Bill Davis is now treating the Ontario Provincial Police like a custom body shop, asking decorated police Member officers King Vaughan, to cover to and hide the cost from taxpayers. Will the Deputy Premier admit that this is wrong and echo our call to have Street the RCMP to to look into this abuse of power I by the Premier? couldn't hear the member who had the floor because of the volume. Stop the clock. I couldn't hear the member for the volume of the government side. So if I miss something, that's why. I again say to the member for Essex, you've got the floor and you can put your question. Thank you, Speaker. The question is to the Deputy Premier. Will she admit that the use of the OPP to cover the costs of the Premier's custom travel van is an abuse of power and wrong to be hiding from taxpayers of Ontario? Members, please take your seat. Question has been referred to the Minister of Community Safety. I will take no lessons from that member or the NDP party on why it is important for the province of Ontario to have heat and hydro as of Friday. Now, there is no truth to the allegations that have been levied, and I look forward to a report coming from the Integrity Commissioner to reinforce why Ron Tavener is an excellent choice to serve as the OPP Commissioner. Next question, the member for King Vaughan. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I find it with great regret that the NDP has yet to ask a singular question about keeping the power on in the province of Ontario. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the people across this province need and deserve a reliable power source. Opposition right now, order. this is at risk. Speaker, ask the NDP twice, twice voted against expiring the passage of the bill. This question. Yeah, who's the question to? Minister of Energy. The Speaker, after twice voting against the passage of this bill, it is abundantly clear, Mr. Speaker, that the NDP is the party of special interest, whereas this government and this Premier and this caucus and this minister is always fighting for the public interest, for our small businesses, for our workers, for our young families, Question. for our seniors, and for the people of the province. We know a strike would devastate our economy. Speaker, can the minister outline why? How, how we will put this forward and ensure Ontarians can keep the light on this Christmas. Good question. Right. Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member's uh, question. Let's start this part of the debate out by understanding that on June 7th of 2018, had the NDP won, thousands of nuclear workers in Pickering would have been cut loose. The electricity system source 
supply would have order. been in absolute chaos. So that's the starting point for these people, Mr. Speaker. But let me reference a few points, some discussion points for him in the course of order. time when the threat of hydro being cut off was very real. The leader of the order. opposition said, let me put my glasses on and read me some quotes here now. 2017. In reference to legislation that would end, or, end winter disconnection, get it through the House quickly. Absolutely. I'm 100 per cent favour for that. Wow. Why is she so disconnected now, Mr. Speaker? She's got her feet there. Back to the Minister of Energy, Speaker. We know this dispute will devastate Ontario's industry, especially our small businesses, where over eight in ten jobs depend on. Mr. Speaker, we have been warned that this could result in rolling blackouts and brownouts, decimating the productivity and quality control factories across the province. It will hurt our workers the most. Our government will not stand idle while employers are forced to close and paychecks on their workers are at risk. Our government believes that everyone deserves safety and stability this holiday season. Can the minister please update this House on how this dispute could impact business and industry in manufacturing? Sure. Minister. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let, let, let me read me a few more quotes while I got my glasses on here. 2017, <laughs> the official leader of the opposition said in response to the threat of hydro being disconnected, why political credit is more important than stopping people from having their hydro cut off. Another quote, when people get cut off in the winter, it has serious consequences here in a province like Ontario. I agree, Mr. Speaker. Position come to order. I, I, I completely, I completely, Member I for completely Hamilton agree, East Stony Mr. Creek, Speaker. Her writing's Hamilton I, I, I couldn't agree more, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more with you. It's cold outside. The other night it was minus 17 below in Kenora. Today, Response. right now, right now it's minus 12 in Timmins, Mr. Speaker. This government has a responsibility to ensure that families Mr. can Governor. turn their lights on, turn their heat on, and The House will come to order. The member for Timmins will come to order. <laughs> member for York Centre will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, um, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Friday night, school boards and education organizations across Ontario were struck by an avalanche of memos outlining $25 million in cuts. These cuts are a slap in the face to those Ontarians who have participated in this government's so-called consultations, which, of course, did not even conclude until 24 hours after these cuts were announced or released rather in the dead of night. And they are causing utter chaos in our school boards and in our schools. Mr. Speaker, overwhelmingly, the programs affected are designed to help at-risk youth. The government has yet to share what actual research they have conducted that shows that children getting physical activity or children getting programming to help them succeed if they're at risk or providing leadership opportunities for, for children are programs that need Question. to be cut. What research does this government conduct or rely on to determine that these programs were worth cutting from our schools? The Deputy Premier. The Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you very much. you and your family Merry Christmas and I appreciate the opportunity to stand up and, and talk about what's really important. You know, while we should be here working diligently on 
expediting, making Member sure for Waterloo, to come to order. and lights on as we head into the holiday season. Instead, we see an opposition party for Windsor West come to order. But I'd be pleased to answer the member opposite's question because, you know, I would think that, or I would have hoped that they could have connected the dots a little bit better because the consultation that we just wrapped up this past weekend where tens of thousands of people responded, and I can't wait to start diving into that data. It's so rich, Speaker. That consultation was based Opposition on a direction come to order. for the next school year Response. of 1920. You would have thought the members opposite could have connected those dots. You know, that's what our consultation was based on. And first and foremost, we received great information on Sorry. <laughs> supplementary. Speaker, back to the Deputy Premier. Uh, this government is, let's be clear, taking an axe to programs that are designed to help some of our most vulnerable students. They call this a responsible act, Mr. Speaker. I don't understand what part of this is responsible. The minister wants us to believe that they are listening to Ontarians, but we have students saying this is the wrong direction. We have educators saying this is the wrong direction. We have parents worrying that their kids won't have the supports they need to succeed this school year. We have experts saying this is deeply irresponsible. In what universe is this West, acceptable? Who did the minister consult? Tell us who told yeah. them that tutors in classrooms were not worth investing in. Indigenous kids were not worth investing in. The government's sex ed consultation has been a total sham, and kids have been Question. put at risk while they make up excuses to carry out changes. Will the government reverse these irresponsible decisions? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, to correct the members opposite that couldn't connect the dots, it's school year 2019 2020. And you know what? I'm Mr. Pleased, Davenport, Speaker, come to order. I am pleased to say that we're moving forward. We moved for forward with approvals of $400 million this year for the school year 2018 2019. And at a glance, that talks about a new investment of over $20 million for mental health workers, over $20 million in French language language education, over $60 million for in STEM initiatives, and we absolutely are supporting our parents. In terms of supports for our young children, in terms of bullying and mentorship, the member from Windsor Tecumseh will be very pleased to know we continued with the support for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Speaker, we're moving forward in a responsible way. I want to thank Bonds. the members of my team and the ministry that worked so hard to make sure we tucked away I'm all the Davenport. irresponsibility that the previous government absolutely buried in my Are ministry, and Number we're moving Essex forward with thoughtful investments that make a difference in the classroom Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Hey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Late last week, our government was advised that the members of the Power Workers Union has voted to reject a new collective agreement on Ontario power generation. This has left the PWU a strike position. Despite attempts at the negotiation over many months, talks between the two parties have broken down. A strike at OPG would greatly impair the stability of Ontario's electricity supply and has a significant adverse impact on the public interest. Our government has to do whatever is necessary to ensure that Ontario has a steady and interrupted supply of electricity. Can the minister assure the people of Ontario that the electricity supply will be maintained over the coming winter months. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. Good. The Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for Markham Unionville for the great question. You know, the people of Ontario elected our government to put their interests first. That is why yesterday I introduced legislation to send this dispute to arbitration and protect Ontarians 
homes and business. So if passed, our legislation will terminate any strikes or lockouts between OPG and the Power Workers Union for the current round of bargaining. This will prevent the effective shutdown of as much as half of Ontario's electricity system. If this legislation does not pass, Mr. Speaker, families, seniors and all Ontarians face the possibility of no heat or light during the cold winter months. Mr. Speaker, we were elected to fight for the people, and that is Response. exactly what our government is doing. Clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for the answer. I know that our government is doing the right thing for the people of Ontario. The Minister of Energy estimated that a strike by the PWU workers will result in some or all of OPG's facilities being shut down within weeks, a situation that we cannot allow to happen. Mr. Speaker, OPG is responsible for approximately 51 per cent of all electricity generation of Ontario and operates nuclear, hydroelectric, thermal and wind power facilities. We are facing a potential provincial emergency. Speaker, action is required now. Ontario is not dreaming of a blackout Christmas. Right. Can the minister explain to this House why this legislation is so wide Question. for Ontario? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, again, and thank the member from Markham Unionville for the question. A 51 per cent reduction in Ontario's power supply is not something the province's families, seniors and businesses can handle during the winter months. My colleague, the Honourable Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, has already discussed the potential impacts of this reduction, like rolling blackouts across the province, resulting in many families and seniors without heat or light during the cold winter months. So, Speaker, our government believes that disputes that arise during contract negotiations are best solved at the bargaining table. Government should only intervene when the public interest and public health and safety are at risk, and a resolution is not possible. This is when negotiations reach an impasse or a deadlock. This is Response. the situation we are facing now. Member for Essex, come Our proposed order. legislation would prevent a severe disruption of Ontario's electricity that could re result and endanger our population. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Attorney General. Last week, the Commissioner of the OPP wrote to the Ombudsman saying that the OPP was called by Dean French, the Premier's most senior political staffer, to ask the OPP to hide the cost of a souped-up camper van. Any reasonable person would agree that that needs to be investigated. Will the Attorney General support the New Democrats' request that the RCMP should investigate these allegations? The Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite heard uh, many, many times from the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, the Integrity Commissioner has taken on the, uh, the work of investigating as the opposition has, requ has requested. Uh, we respect uh, the work that the Integrity Commissioner is Absolutely, going we to do. do. Uh, we, uh, we understand that there is great interest in this and in making sure that the processes are followed, and we welcome and we await the decision of the Integrity Commissioner and uh, we will follow his recommendations when he's made them. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Attorney General has a responsibility to uphold the law and the principles of fairness and due process. It's more important than her loyalty to the Premier. At least it should be. As former RCMP Commissioner Bob Paulson said about the allegation that the Premier's Chief of Staff wanted the the cost of the souped-up RV kept off the books. If there's allegations of criminality supported by some substantial evidence, then that's a whole other question, and that needs to be reviewed. And that would require, I think, a separate force to do that. Not my words, um, Bob Paulson's words. Does the Attorney General agree that the RCMP is ideally suited to investigate these allegations? The Attorney General. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite should realize there are already active processes underway doing the work that the opposition is requesting. The, uh, the, the, uh, the Office of the, of the Integrity Commissioner is conducting an investigation. An application Member has been filed Waterloo with the Divisional Dora. Court seeking a judicial review of the Ombudsman's decision not to investigate Member for Essex, judges, Come and we'll be looking at that decision. Mr. Speaker, there are people who are doing the work the opposition is already asking us to do. Mr. Speaker, we are here to do work on behalf of the people of Ontario to keep the lights on, to keep the heat on, and we wonder on this side of the House when the opposition is going to understand that that is why we are here. Let the people who are doing the work do the work with us. Stop the clock. I apologize to the Attorney General for having to cut her off when there was still time on the clock. I couldn't hear what she was saying because of the standing ovation from the government side. Once again. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Eighteen years ago, six people died, and over 2,000 people were made sick as a result of drinking contaminated water at Walkerton. There are people to this very day who suffer from the health effects of drinking contaminated water. Justice O'Connor's report on the Walkerton tragedy led to the Clean Water Act. So my question is, why is the government putting people's lives at risk with legislation that would allow municipalities to gut the Clean Water Act. Good question. Questions to the Deputy Premier? To the Minister of the Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation yeah. and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, as the, uh, as the member knows, just a few weeks ago, we brought out a plan, a Made in Ontario plan, that deals with issues like clean water, that talks about many of the issues that he's quite concerned about, including sewage in the water system, things that the previous government, the previous government supported by the NDP, did not, uh, did not support. The member also knows, because he's very familiar, very familiar with the Clean Water Act, uh, that the powers that, uh, that the Minister of Affairs order. has and are suggested in Bill 66 are the same powers that he has member today. For Tim Mr. Speaker, to order. Member for we understand why the member from Guelph may want to distract from other issues when we should be focusing on keeping the lights on and keeping the power on here in this, in this legislature. But let Niagara me be Falls clear, Mr. Speaker. This government's committed to making sure that the water is kept clear. Our Made in Ontario plan includes plans to make Response. sure that we ensure that with proper source water protection and protection of water across this province. <laughs> Supplementary. With all due respect, Mr. Speaker, Section 10 of Bill 66 allows municipalities to gut the Clean Water Act. What kind of business wants to invest in a province that will not protect its drinking water? What kind of government wants to gut regulations that protect people's lives? Likewise, the Green Belt uh, protects our drinking water and protects our farmland. People were loud and clear during the election campaign they want the green belt protected. So why is this government breaking their promise to protect the green belt and introducing legislation that will allow municipalities to pave over the green belt? Minister, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and House. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. To you, to uh, the honourable member, the opposition is dragging the town of Walkerton through the mud just to try to score a couple cheap. of uh, political oh, cheap, cheap shots. Water. Their mayor has even indicated that the changes in our bill would not weaken nor will they jeopardize drinking water standards. We have been extremely thirsty, and again, through, through you to the honourable member, we are going to protect the Green Belt. We are going to not support any uh, municipal plan under the Open for Business tool that would do that. We want to again reassure Ontarians that the safety of the people of this province, we take it very seriously. We are going to continue to defend health and safety standards. Anything else from this member is just fear-mongering. 
Shame on you. Shame on you for using this House to further off the clock. Order. Yet again, I'll say to the government's side, their minister had the floor, there was time on the clock. But when the standing ovation erupted, I couldn't hear what he said. I had to cut him off. Start the clock. The next question, member from Mississauga, Milt Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, last week, Ontario's Ontarians found out that members of Power Workers Union voted to reject a collective agreement with Ontario Power Generation. The Power Workers Union issued a strike notice on Friday, which has put the entire electric system at risk. Mr. Speaker, this time of year, families are coming together to celebrate the holiday season. They need access to power to light up their homes, to cook their turkeys. Oh, by the way, tofu turkey for vegetarians like my wife. <laughs> and watch holiday movies with their loved ones. We can't afford to let this job action threaten holiday plan throughout this province. Minister, please explain why this is such a critical issue that requires immediate action by our government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's day four. A very serious Day 21 plan to yep. wind down the nuclear reactor, uh, nuclear generators and dam units that, that supply electricity for our province. We have given the opposition two occasions already to short-circuit the debate and make sure that the people of Ontario have lights and heat for the holidays and as we head into the heart of winter. But let me amplify the seriousness of this, Mr. Speaker, from other stakeholders. Mr. Caller Anderson, the president of the Association Emerton, of Major Hamilton Power East Stony Creek Ontario, Ontario stated, business across Ontario expect that reliable, affordable electricity is available when needed to keep our economy running. Industry can't afford any disruptions that undermine the ability to produce. The government must do whatever it can with generators and labors to keep the light on, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly what we're doing. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your great leadership on Energy File. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that takes action on behalf of the people. And I know my constituents appreciate us coming back to work to ensure that they stay safe and warm this holiday season. However, let's not forget, we are already seeing the opposition's cringe ways. They voted against unanimous consent for Bill 67. Come on. NDP voted against a bill that guarantees families staying warm and keep their lights on this holiday season. It seems they don't think that people across Ontario need and deserve a reliable power supply, especially over the winter months. Can the minister please tell the member of this House how our government is ensuring the people of Ontario can keep the lights on this winter to stay safe and stay healthy. Thank Minister. you. Well, Mr. Speaker, when 50 per cent of Ontario's hydro supply is at stake, we take this issue very seriously. We appreciate the Power Workers Union, Mr. Speaker. They issued their right to strike their vote to strike and strike notice on Friday, and they remain on the job. And we appreciate that because we think they understand the importance of no interruptions during this critical season of peak demand and temperatures getting colder, Mr. Speaker. After eight months of negotiations, three votes, Mr. Speaker, a rejection of the final offer on Thursday, a vote to strike on Friday, and the option for arbitration, Mr. Speaker, every right has been afforded to resolve this. This is now less about rights than it is about lights, Mr. Speaker. And this government is going to fight every day, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the people of Ontario, families Response. and small businesses, ready to celebrate Christmas and face the winter, have the heat on, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, and Culture and Sport. On October 22nd, while the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport 
was still the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, the ministry posted to hire a new commissioner of the OPP. It required that anyone applying had to have served as a deputy police chief or higher, or assistant commissioner or higher. Two days later, the posting was changed. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport who decided to change the application. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Thank Services. Thank you very much. As usual, the NDP are missing a few facts. The facts are that it was an independent hiring committee that were, was, was tasked with finding candidate-wide a new OPP commissioner. They've done that work. They made a unanimous choice, and now we are waiting a review of the independent officer of the assembly to do that. You know, I lived through three days in a number of Christmases ago in my community when there was no power. No heat, no hydro. I don't want to do that again, Speaker. I have a responsibility as a member of this government to make sure that doesn't happen again. And I would hope respectfully that the member opposite also has that same responsibility. The families who live in your community, the families who rely on William Olsler Hospital, the families who have seniors living in Brampton who don't want to worry about whether they have sufficient heat and light to make sure they can stay in their own homes. I would appreciate some conversation with the NDP and acknowledgement and understanding. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question once again is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Ron Tavener didn't meet the initial requirement for the posting, but then the posting changed, ensuring he could. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of uh, Tourism was the Minister at the time of Community Safety and Corrections. Can he explain why the government decided two days, two days after posting, to water down a requirement that would have just happened to have prevented the Premier's personal friend from applying for the post? Who made the decision to change this posting? Questions to refer to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, I feel like we need to talk about what the definition of an independent is. It was an independent hiring committee. It was an independent commissioner of the Legislative Assembly. Member who for Timmins, come to order. Process. And we are Member in Waterloo, come day four of a strike that can shut down heat and light in the province of Ontario. Yeah. So if we want to talk about an emergency debate, I'm all over it. But let's actually get to the process where we understand why we're here, why we need to ensure that the light and the power stays on in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Great answer. The next question, the member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Continues to make short sighted decisions with public purse. Last week, the Premier, the Premier cut funding to Ontario's College of Midwives. Speaker, women want access to more midwifery services in Ontario. Actually, 40 per cent of women who request the midwives here are unable to get one because there's not enough to meet the demand. My colleagues' children have had children with the help of midwives. Actually, very important, midwives improve health outcomes while bringing down medical costs. And this is exactly why I'm asking you this question, Mr. Speaker, because yesterday I was in a retirement residence and Frank, a senior, could not understand why this government was attacking our midwife services. So my question is very question. simple. Can you please tell Frank and all of Ontario the reason why of these cuts? Minister of Health well, and Long-Term Care. I, I thank the member opposite very much for the question, and I can say that we agree that we value the support and the work that midwives in Ontario perform, but I think it's important to note that services performed by midwives are not being cut. What is under consideration oh, is under consideration. funding to the college. 
The college is the only administrative body, the only college in Ontario that receives administrative funding for the province. That is under review right now. But I must, drink, I must reiterate to Frank and anybody else who might be watching that the actual services being performed yeah. by midwives will not be cut. It is only consideration of uh, the services that the college might provide, which is still under review. You are welcome. Supplementary. So back to the minister. This government, by improvisation, is not improvising everything. They have a plan. They are deliberately focused on making cuts that hit women, children, children at risk, vulnerable children, and I would say language rights issues. And that's not fair. Even, even, Mr. Speaker, the inflated deficit number they cooked up, the one actually that the controller resigned and would not sign off on, can justify the waste of public money that will result from these cuts. So I understand the minister when she says that at this point there is 800 midwives in Ontario. There is an enormous burden on them as they are I would say almost creating jobs for Question. you, lowering your costs on health care. Why attacking this sector at this time while you know there's a demand and actually lowering our Minister. I don't know how you answer. Well, I, I have to reject wow. the entire question <laughs> that's been asked here. The entirety of the question. What we are doing and what we were elected to do was to transform our health care system into one that's going to be sustainable for the future for our children and grandchildren, and that is exactly what we are doing. So as far as midwives are concerned, of course we value the work that midwives perform, but we need to make sure that we can do so on a, on a sustainable basis, and they are continuing with the work they are doing. It is only the question of money to the college that is being looked at right now. But I also have to say that this is an issue that we are dealing with, that we are working on, but we have to, again, come back to the reason why we are here. We are here to make sure that people can keep their heat on, to make sure that seniors, that people who are living in northern Ontario, people who are in long-term care homes in hospitals, will be able to be cared for and will be warm and receive the necessary Thank you. Question, a member for Cambridge. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. The previous Liberal government attacked our frontline health care workers instead of ensuring that they had the resources to look after our most vulnerable. Our families and loved ones were left languishing. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Waiting for beds, hospital budget. Member for Eglinton Lawrence, years come to order. My constituents in Cambridge and families across Ontario Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek people, come to order to deliver on our plan to end hallway health care. Over the past Member for Hamilton years, East Stony Creek is warned crumbled due to mismanaged expansions and renovations. While work on the new patient care wing at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital was stalled, renovations to the existing area have also been delayed. Can the minister please update the house on how we are getting the Cambridge Memorial Hospital back on track? Great question. The Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, from Cambridge for that very important question. Our government is firmly committed to making life easier for the families in Ontario. For the Cambridge Memorial Hospital project, Infrastructure Ontario was directed to deliver the work through the P3 model as a build finance project. This new 240,000 square foot addition was supposed to be operational 20 months ago under the former Liberal government. Wow. This type of delay causes much anxiety in the local communities served by this particular hospital. People were expecting better care to be delivered much longer ago. I'm not happy with this project we inherited from the previous government because it's been delayed so long, but Mr. Speaker, we're going to fix it. I know the local member from Cambridge, who has been advocating hard on behalf of her constituents, as well as the members from Kitchener Response. South Hospital and Kitchener Conestoga, aren't happy either. The people of Cambridge deserve better. Speaker, there's positive news, which I'm going to share in the supplement. Supplementary. 
thank the minister for his response. I am proud that our government is working hard to look after the needs of families and seniors across the Tri-City and Waterloo Region. They will soon have the quality health care that they deserve and expect. Instead of sitting idly, as the former Liberal government did, our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and the Minister of Infrastructure have secured assurances that all parties are committed to moving forward as quickly as possible to complete the project. I know I speak on behalf of the members from Kitchener South Hespeler and Kitchener Conestoga when I say that the Minister of Infrastructure has been working hard to make sure that our government will continue to invest in the right infrastructure at the right time and in the right place. Can the minister please elaborate on how the P3 model protects taxpayers and ensures that the project question. gets done? Great question. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'll tell you that my office has been in close touch with Infrastructure Ontario, the agency delivering this project on behalf of our government. As you know, the project is being delivered as a public-private partnership or P3 model, something that our government supports. P3 projects offer certain protections to taxpayers. One of those protections is that the company contracted to do the work doesn't get paid until that work is complete. There has been a recent development in the situation. The project is now in the hands of a receiver who will ensure the hospital finally gets completed. I O, the hospital and the project lenders are working together and are committed to completing the project quickly. So while the delays for residents in the Cambridge region are unacceptable, we are assured by Infrastructure Ontario that the construction issues Response. are on their way to being solved at no additional cost to the taxpayers in the province of Ontario. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you. My question this morning is to the President of the Treasury Board. Good morning, Minister. You know, I spent months sitting on a committee supposedly focused on uh, fiscal transparency, and your gov the government t tabled a bill named Restoring Trust, Transparency and Accountability. But less than a month after tabling that bill, we've learned that the Premier's Chief of Staff asked the OPP to hide the cost of a special camper van for the Premier's use. I'm sure the President of the Treasury Board would agree that that's not accountable, it's not transparent, and it certainly doesn't build trust. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is uh, will the President of the Treasury Board refer this matter to the Auditor General for her to investigate? President of the Treasury Board. The Ministry of Consumer, uh, Community Safety and Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Opposition, you know, come to order. It, it amazes me that the NDP are th so willing to throw around allegations in this yep. chamber that are untrue, Smears. that are will be proven to be untrue, and that there is an independent investigation occurring right now. Yeah. So why don't you let that investigation happen? And instead, why don't we focus on what we are here to debate? Mm -hmm. What we are here to discuss is to make sure that the power stays on in the province of Ontario. Friday is an important date, and it's not just because Christmas is coming. We have to make sure we have a responsibility as legislators to make sure that the heat and the lights remain on in the province of Ontario. That's what we're doing on this side of the House. Response. I can't speak to what the NDP are attempting to do. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have to say I reject the premise of the answer. <laughs> Ontarians deserve uh, clear answers about whether this was a one-off or part of a pattern. Uh, will the President of the Treasury Board be directing the Auditor General to look into whether the Premier or his Chief of Staff uh, asked other ministries, other agencies or boards to buy and to hide the cost of this camper van or any other items? Minister, members will please take their seats. So let me try to understand uh, how this works. You do not agree that the integrity commissioner is able to do an investigation and to, and and uh, report on the process, but. While you don't support the integrity commissioner, you are calling for the ombudsman to do an investigation. 
Which of the independent officers of the legislation do you like? Which ones do you trust? Because Opposition I can tell you, order. in our government, we support and believe in all of them. Stop the clock. I think it's appropriate to remind all members at this time to make your comments through the chair. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara West. To the Minister of Transportation, you know, our government has promised to get the people of Ontario moving, and we've already started to deliver on these commitments. We're providing more reliable, predictable journeys across the GTHA, greatly improving the daily transit experience. Speaker, last week the Minister of Transportation made a very exciting announcement for the people of St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, and frankly, all of Ontario. This announcement delivers on our government's commitment to get people moving, and I was so excited to see the minister in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. Can the minister please tell the legislature about his announcement in St. Catharines and provide details on how we're implementing a core campaign promise? The minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I. Uh... Thank the member from Niagara West uh, for that question. I truly uh, enjoyed having him at the side uh, at that announcement. Uh, he's been a truly great advocate for the Niagara region as a whole, and I know he'll just continue to produce results for the people living in that region. So, I also want to thank my uh, PA from uh, Etobicoke Centre, uh, King of Sermon, who's also there in attendance. It was a great day for uh, the St. Catharines area, and I do have to note that uh, it was something special to have uh, former House Leader of the Liberal side, Jim Bradley, the new chair of uh, Niagara region. Applauding our announcement for the Niagara region. As a member stated, our government for the people made an important announcement for the people of St. Catharines and Niagara. And Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, this marks the first time in history the people of Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, and Toronto uh, will be connected by a regular weekday commuter train. This train will provide a comfortable, seamless go train trip between Niagara Falls Wait, Union Station go. with a stop at St. Catharines. And Mr. Speaker, we are four years ahead of schedule on delivering yeah. this job. will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, I have to thank the Minister of Transportation for the excellent response, for coming down to Niagara and for bringing the project here to Niagara four years ahead of schedule. Truly, truly impressive. As a member representing the Niagara region, I must say I'm deeply proud of this announcement. For the people of Niagara Falls and St. Catharines have been asking for go rail service for a very long time. And sadly, the previous Liberal government planned to take an additional four years to expand the go rail service into the region. However, within only six months, our government for the people delivered on this commitment by using existing infrastructure and developing partnerships to get the job done. Our government has now announced more than 200 new GO train trips and over 400,000 new train seats every single week on the Lakeshore East and Lakeshore West rail lines. And so, can the minister tell us a little bit more about the expanded GO Questions. rail service into the Niagara region? Great minister. Thank you uh, for the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, as the member stated, by working with a rail partner, CN, uh, we have coordinated our schedules and are using existing infrastructure and we're able to introduce this new weekday service between Niagara Falls and Toronto. The introduction of weekday rail service between Niagara Falls and Toronto is an important piece of work we're doing to expand GO service and make life easier for the people that use public transit. We know that efficient and reliable public transit is an essential part of connecting people with jobs and promoting economic development across Ontario. That's why we made it a priority to get GO trains running to Niagara Falls as soon as possible, and I'm pleased we've delivered on that commitment. Our government for the people is doing this not only to get people in the province moving, but also to create jobs and opportunities that make life better for Ontarians. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be back in Niagara Falls to make more announcements Response. as we go forward during our mandate. Next question, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last Thursday, 
This Conservative government announced, with little explanation, that they were cutting funding for the College of Midwives. Speaker, the College of Midwives Order. exists for one reason: Order. to protect the public. In this case, the member for King Vaughan will come to order. Newborn babies, midwives deliver and provide postpartum care to 15 percent of Ontario newborn babies. Member for King Vaughan is warned. In doing so, midwife saves the government money, save the hospital resources, and they help save Ontario hallway medicine crisis. Can the minister explain why, on November 8, her minister advised the College of Midwives that their, co that their funding was being cut retroactive to April 1st? Why did your ministry send this memo? Minister of Health. Well, again, I, I thank the member for the question, and we do value the excellent services that midwives provide to women across Ontario. In fact, the issue that is under consideration right now is funding to the college. And as I stated previously, the College of Midwives is the only regulatory health college in Ontario to receive administrative funding from the province. So that is under consideration right now, but the services being performed by, by midwives continue. Right. Supplementary. Speaker, midwives have been historically discriminated against when it comes to fair pay. These women won a human rights tribunal challenge this year to be paid fairly. Now we find out that the Conservative government is appealing this landmark human rights tribunal judgment. So this Conservative government refuses to pay midwives fairly. They refuse to support their college that protects newborn babies, all in order. the name of balancing the budget. Stormont Dundas, South Glen Gary, come to order. Action are sending such a powerful and such a hateful message to midwives, while at the same time, every community is trying to recruit them, and we have a hard time recruiting people into the profession of midwives. Can the minister explain why Question. she is appealing the human rights decision to end discrimination and fair pays for midwives? Minister. Well, in fact, we respect the work that midwives are doing, and that is why we have told them straight out that we don't agree with the Human Rights Tribunal decision with respect to certain points, and that's why we communicated up front to the midwives that we, uh, in light of our disagreement with the decision with respect to liability and the significantly different approaches both parties take in relation to the remedy that is being propo proposed, we are too far apart on the issue of remedy for the negotiation to continue. So we thought, to be fair to, to the midwives, it was fair to let them know that we were going to proceed and have the matter determined at the next level. Question the member for Durham. Speaker, my question is for the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Ontario's rural communities like Port Perry and Blackstock in my riding are some of the most tight-knit communities across the province, where neighbours look out for one another. However, these small towns are not exempt from sex trafficking and violence against women. Police reported rates of violence against women are often higher in small towns and other rural settings than in urban areas. Not only that, but residents of rural and remote communities often have to travel further to access programs and support. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to combat violence against women in rural communities? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much to the honourable member for the very important question. And I was very pleased to see her and the Minister of Environment last week take a stand in Durham against human trafficking. And I really want to say thank you for them. Uh, as you know, Speaker, uh, our government has decided to in uh, invest an additional $1.5 million into funding for rural frontline services to strengthen service delivery, improve culturally relevant supports for, of Indigenous women, and reduce geographic and transportation barriers. And I'd be remiss not to say thank you to the, to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Minister of Natural Resources for joining me last Friday in that very important conversation. I'll more to say in the supplemental. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I appreciate that our minister and our government is working hard to provide survivors of violence that support they need in rural communities. 
Ontario accounts for roughly two-thirds of police-reported sex trafficking cases across Canada each year, many of those along the 401 corridor through my riding, through Bowmanville, through Oshawa. When someone is trafficked, they are moved frequently, exacerbating the trauma of these already horrifying situations. For survivors, returning to normalcy can feel impossible. Can the minister please tell this House how our government will continue to work with stakeholders and hear from those with lived experiences to address these important issues? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. I, I really appreciate the question. This is an important uh, topic. It's an important uh, a piece of work that we're doing in this government, and of course, uh, my, our, our friend, the Minister of Labour, was very instrumental in making sure that we were having these strong conversations well before people were talking about this. It is Ontario's dirty little secret sex trafficking of young girls as, as early as 11. I was pleased to bo bo be, both be in Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke and in Brockville on Friday to join my colleagues as we talked with people with lived experience who are offering support to those who have been trafficked. And Let me be perfectly clear. The work that this government is doing is going to be, continue to be robust. We will work with other jurisdictions, including our federal counterparts, uh, on a task force that, uh, that will bring this to the fore. And Speaker, I must say I'm very impressed with many of those stakeholders across Ontario who are doing this important work and building on the $174.5 million commitment this government made last week. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning. Member for Scarborough Guildwood on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I would like to welcome a school from my riding that is visiting Queen's Park today, West Hill Collegiate, and 83 high school students will be here to learn about what we do. Thank you. The member for Kitchener Conestoga on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to apologize for uh, an interjection that uh, I had made earlier. Uh, if it offended anybody on the other side of the house, I do apologize for that. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Orléans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, today, in question period, the Minister, Minister of Community Safety and Correction Services says that the Integrity Commissioner is in charge of that investigation. I look forward for the report because I know he will find that there was nothing wrong. And I quote: "Giving the nature." of the investigation before the Integrity Commissioner, surely Standing Order 23G must be interpreted to this matter. The minister has presupposed the outcome of the Integrity Commissioner's investigation, creating a real and substantial precedence to the proceeding. Okay. I don't believe there is a valid point of order based on what the member has, has indicated. Um, it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of opinion, but it's not a point of order. I would remind the members, who I repeatedly called to order and had to warn, that the warnings carry over into the afternoon, and if the, whoever's in the chair has to speak to you again, you may be named. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.